a yellow star hung. Citadels, shrouds and trods. During the summer solstice, magical fortifications were raised by imperial magicians across the empire. The dripping echoes of the fen rose in Drownbuck Forest in Ossium, helping to protect the territory from the Druge. Four frozen citadels were summoned from the summer realm in Operus, Cayley, in Sierra Bianti, and in Clipion, in Zenith. Magical penumbral veils still hang over the Verushkin territory of Ossium, the freeborn territories of Madruga and Karaman, and the Druge territories of the Barons and Zenith. Rituals that try to divine information about or scry into these territories will first need to overcome the power of the veil. There may be other veils in place. News of shrouds only come from the places where the Empire has a notable presence. Finally, during the solstice, the Navarre worked with the General of the Citadel Guard to channel the power of spring magic into Zenith. The Dance of Navarre and Thorn has been successfully performed, restoring the trots of the territory. Rain gentle and savage. Regrow the Land's Heart was performed on the territory of Zenith, again with the assistance of the Citadel Guard. Unlike the enchantment woven across the rest of the Empire, the ritual had its normal effect in Zenith. Sadly, the effect is somewhat muted. The ritual helps to accelerate recovery from the scars of war, physical and spiritual, but much of the territory is still riven by fighting. Its effects are mostly felt in Iteri and Western Clipion, areas where the hold of the Druze invaders has been weakened. In those places, at least, a healthy new growth is encouraged, and the remaining Urizen population are given a much-needed infusion of hope for the future. In the rest of the territory, unfortunately, the effects have apparently been quite limited. Although there are reports that the enchantment has definitely encouraged a burst of growth across the marshes of Preseris, bringing forth a riot of brightly coloured flowers in between the deep octopus-haunted pools and ruined cisterns. News from the Barrens is that the territory has been rocked by dreadful storms. While not on the same scale as those striking the Empire proper, there are reports of thunder, lightning and tumultuous rain. The worst of the storms strike Bitter Strand and Salt Marsh, but by all accounts, every region bordering the Barren Sea is pummeled by mighty waves and even the occasional water spout. The extent of the damage is not clear, but it's likely that the fangs have been blunted and Salt Marsh flooded at the very least. This tempestuous assault is widely believed to be the result of a visit to the Barrens paid by the Archmage of Spring, Sir Fabien de Miel, and some friends during the summer solstice. Whispering Gate. During the autumn equinox, it will be possible to perform Whispers Through the Black Gate between 7 and 8 o'clock in the evening. The current Imperial Necromancer is Enchantress Claudia Vokulova Remis. The Black Gate can be opened to allow Masters of Winter Magic to commune with the spirits of the dead. For reasons that have never been adequately explained, the gate can only be opened at twilight, when it's neither quite day nor quite night. Imperial magicians prognosticate that this means during the autumn equinox the ritual can be performed between the hours of 7 and 8 in the evening. This information is of course of particular relevance to the Imperial Necromancer, given their powers and responsibilities. A note about Covid restrictions and whispers. We often have players coming to the makeup department for help with wounds and lineage trappings when they're the subject of whispers. But because of the restrictions around providing makeup for players, we're not going to be able to help you with that. You'll still have to do your own makeup yourself in your own area using your own supplies. This also applies to the Regio tent. Please don't come and sit in the Regio tent applying your makeup. We need to keep the Regio tent as free of players and subjects uh, as much as we can because it's quite a small tent. Feast of Want. Herb gardens in Zenith have been cursed. While the restorative enchantment has been providing some succour to the people of beleaguered Zenith, a cruel curse has also fallen on the territory following the summer solstice. All herb gardens in the territory are plagued by a lacklustre harvest of crops, and no amount of tending seems to be able to restore them to their full glory. As a consequence, every herb garden has provided three fewer true vervain than normal and one fewer doses of each other herb. The effect appears to have run its course with a notable improvement in the health of the plants as the autumn equinox approaches. 
It's unlikely, but not impossible, that the curse was placed by the Druze. While there are certainly herb gardens belonging to Uruzeni citizens that have been ravaged by the magic, the effect is greatly amplified on the invader orcs, simply because of their reliance on healing herbs and the fact that many more gardens are controlled by the Druze than the remaining Uruzen. Still, the surviving Imperial citizens in the territory will be feeling the pinch, especially when it comes to treating the kind of envenomed wounds the orcs of the Malum seem to favour. We're water horses. Following the summer solstice, every person in Weirwater who's previously felt even a mild affinity for or curiosity about horses experiences vivid dreams about riding a galloping horse on an unknown shore on a moonless night. As well as the presence of the horse and the shore, every dream also involves powerful storms and rain, lightning, lashing winds and open water. Many of those who experience the dream report fantastical elements as well. Riding a flying mount or a half-fish, half-horse creature that dives deep beneath the waters of the Semelac to explore sunken ruins. Only those who would welcome such a dream experience it. The dreamer learns nothing about the horses that they didn't already know, but awake feeling exhilarated and full of wonder. There's some speculation that this enchantment may somehow be connected to the strange treasures left on the shores of the Semelac, although nobody in the other territories bordering the lakes reports any such dream. A dream of vibrant connections. There is a dream that has disturbed the sleep of many across the whole of the Empire this season. Not often, just once or twice, but they begin to talk about it. Those who've had it in the taverns and the towns... Some things seem to be the same for whoever dreams it. It begins with swirling coloured spinning and then coloured feathers soaring up into the sky. As the dreamer looks up, they feel themselves weightless, fall backwards, and then the scene shifts and other images appear before them. From this point, the tales of the images seem to fragment. Each dreamer sees themselves, yet all describe themselves sitting alone in a room, thinking... The thoughts that arise galvanise quickly into urgency, a driven need to make others understand, to bring connection, illuminate meaning, to convince someone of something. And each of them rushes in their own way to pick up a paintbrush or a pencil or a lump of clay and a chisel and a stone and begin to create. Each of them wakes before their masterpiece is done, inspired to try again by day. Three more things are said to be the same among all dreamers. First, they are already artists. Not one of them has been heard to imagine themselves taking up a new medium in this dream or starting to create what they did not before. Second, they all wake from the dream with a truth in their heart. Art can do this. It bridges gaps and eases misunderstandings. And this is a truth that they yearn to discuss with others who know it too. Third, there is a name whispered light as a feather that stays with them on waking. That name is Farron Silver Streams. On an out-of-character note, any player who considers their character to be a visual artist may decide that they've heard this dream. There's no need for the character to believe that they are a skilled visual artist, just that they've already been doing art in some visual medium, whether for themselves or for others. You're free to roleplay your response to the message and name the dream leaves behind in any way that feels appropriate to you. A light that never goes out. The key, also known as the torch, the lantern and the wand, is a constellation of discovery, revelation and the conquering of mystery. As the conjunction of the lock has faded and the seasons have changed, a reciprocative shift in the key has followed, as if connected by an unseen thread of causality. This minor shift in the prominence of the seeking stars has been felt subtly across the Empire, following the truism of as above, so below. The truth seems easier to speak. Secrets lie more heavily upon the hearts of their keepers, and the wonder of discovery and understanding effervesces beneath the surface of every sensation. More keenly experienced by the young, the key's influence has only grown. It's moving towards an apogee that coincides with the approaching equinox. As this date has approached, incidents of spellcasters being ridden or touched by the kit, as well as reports of strange visions and snatches of odd music, 
interfering with rituals cast at the Imperial Regio. Once per day, while standing at the Imperial Regio, any character with magician skill may evoke the constellation of the Lock to perform detect magic without expending any personal mana. If they do so, they experience the following role-playing effect. You feel a strong urge to apply yourself, to use what makes you unique in the service of overcoming ignorance and secrecy. This effect lasts for an hour or until overcome in the usual way. Furthermore, any ritualist who evokes the key whilst performing a divination ritual or performing detect magic at the Imperial Regio may choose to experience the following role-playing effect. Gaps in your understanding are opportunities to discover and reveal. You experience a powerful sense of achievement when you discover or help others discover new things. Once experienced, the effect will remain until the start of the winter solstice, but can be overcome in all the usual ways. Once overcome, however, it will not return. After the game is over. During the summer solstice, a team of Imperial heroes represented Sakalwi as the Eternal competed to become the patron of the Icy Crag. Now, the Hunter of Tides issues an invitation to three participants and their advisors to attend an audience in which they can discuss what they've learned, what went well and what could have been done differently. The meeting will take place at 10 in the evening on Friday night, in a chamber reached through the Hall of Worlds. The Herald who delivers the invitation makes clear that this is only for the three contestants and their three advisors. There is no intent to snub the Archmage of Day, but this is a personal matter between the Eternal and their allies, rather than anything that bears on the relationship of the Realm of Day and the Empire. Ash and Dust. Conjunction. Sky Mages, the magical backbone of many elite Grendel units, they are as enamoured with their nation's unique perspective of prosperity as any other Grendel. And, being at the forefront of military actions, they are perhaps the best place to acquire and exploit the magical esoterica of their unconquered foes. This is a dire mixture in a land such as Screed, stained as it is by the accursed malignancy of the Black Plateau, where the unwary, the insolent and the arrogant will find their match in chaotic forces, whose disturbance may bring foul consequences for the spires neighbouring the Plateau, if not the wider empire. Sensible Grendel are definitely avoiding the area. However, scouts keeping an eye on the region from Oblivion's Edge almost saw Cambion, owing to that lineage's capacity for enduring the malign atmosphere in Spiral, outside the Spires, indicate that one particular group of Orc magicians and their entourage has pressed beyond where even these veterans of the black glassy landscape can tolerate to travel. They've pressed into the stark, rugged portions of the plateau, where ash sluices like water and even plant life seems to grow twisted and disturbed. What they're doing there is not clear, but they've certainly not returned. Urged by news from the scouts, the civil service prognosticators have discovered a conjunction to the area of Kephalos's Delve, which is where the Grendel have been spotted. There's some controversy around the conjunction. The Urizen magician who divined it reports a powerful interaction with both the lock and key that threatened to overwhelm her senses. A tentative attempt to repeat their divination confirmed the conjunction, but didn't bring with it any unexpected results. Given the nature of the conjunction, its location, and the uncertainty about precisely what's going on there, the civil service have asked the Archmage of Night to arrange for a group to travel there, to see what the Grendel are doing, if they think it's appropriate. Perhaps after ascertaining if anyone knows anything about this place, or why some Grendel Sky Mages might be interested in it. All is fair, all is permitted. Conjunction. As autumn continues, the most northerly reaches of Verushka will begin to fall beneath a thick coat of ice and snow that will deepen throughout winter, only to recede when it's worn out all hospitality and is asked to leave by spring. One location where Mother Winter will rest her heels longest is Brez, in the far north of Volodmarts, where the reports are that little snow has already begun to fall on the pine-blanketed foothills and crags. In such conditions, the roads can quickly become impassable for the unwary. One such group of the unwary has been identified by civil service prognosticators, through their divinations and scrying, it's allowed a little more than the impression that the Sentinel Gate will deliver heroes from Anvil to long-forgotten ruins and the presence of travellers. 
It has also identified a curious twist in fate that connects the travellers with some aspect of the ruins in which it can be assumed that they are sheltering. However, those civil service members drawn from the remote regions of Arushka themselves are quick to remind those planning to enter this conjunction that beyond the roads, one is entirely at the mercy of monsters that stalk such remote locations and will make quick work of the lost and unprepared. The civil service have asked the boyar of the sovereign's head to arrange a group of wardens and other interested parties to go on the expedition. The conjunction leading to deepest, darkest Volodmarts has been identified by civil service prognosticators at 20.45 on Saturday night to Adolis Fall in Brez. Both of these encounters, for accessibility purposes, are rated as combat highly likely. A gift of law. During the summer solstice, Olik the Wanderer promised that if the Empire was ravaged by what he referred to as an imperial curse, then he would place the concordance of earthbound stars into Urizen law. With almost the entire Empire ravaged by storms, he has proved to be as good as his word. A week ago, four new rituals became available to Urizen ritual magicians. The Mirror of Perfection, Flame and the Flood, an echo of songs and the stargazer's astrolabe can now all be mastered and performed by those with access to Urizen law. Three days before the autumn equinox, another ritual becomes part of Urizen law. It is called Treacher's Quill, and it apparently comes from a book entitled Ceremonies of the Black Drop Society. It allows anyone with even a rudimentary grasp of winter magic to send a special missive to the eternal agrament.